Good morning, Philadelphia Bible Fellowship. Good morning. I want to welcome everyone at home and everyone that's in the congregation in the house of the Lord today on this Labor Day weekend. You know, I'm real excited about this message this morning. Actually, I'm excited about all the messages that I give and all the messages that the pastors give here. But this weekend, on this Labor Day weekend, I want to talk about labor. Now, my scripture this morning is Matthew 9, verses 35 to 38. If you would open your Bible, your phones, and we all meet right there. I'll give you a minute to get there. Okay, it says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The grass fades and the flowers fall, and the word of our Lord will stand forever. The title of my message this morning is Help Wanted. You know, when I was a young man back in the day, not too many years ago, but back in the day, I learned what labor was. When I was young, there was a tennis shoe that came out, that first came out. And the name of that tennis shoe was the Converse All-Stars. Everybody was buying them. I was noticing everybody was wearing them. I went to my mother and asked her, Mom, could you buy me a pair of these Converse All-Stars? My mother said, well, son, I can't afford it. Those shoes at that time were about 10, 15, maybe $20 at that time. So that, what that told me was, ending up this sun, summer, I was heading back to school with those $2 pair of Bobos that I always, my mother would buy me. You remember, I don't know if you remember, but you go in these supermarkets, the big cardboard box filled with shoes, tied the pairs, tied together, and you go and you look for your size and pull out the pair that you need that fits you. They even had a song about these shoes. It went something like this. Bobos, it makes your feet feel fine. Bobos, it costs $1.99. You know, even to this day, something about that song does something to me. But I'm a little bit better now. I'm better. So what that told me is I had to go out and make some money. And around this time, I met an elderly couple that they needed some yard work done around their house. And that would be my first paying job, only on Saturdays, though. So I said, yeah, I, I would like to come out and, and see uh, what I need to do. So they told me, well, next weekend, come on out, and we'll show you around. Now, their house wasn't nowhere around the city. I had to catch a few buses even to get there. Now, when I got there, there were some big houses and some yards. Them yards were so big, I'd never even seen yards that big before. And what happened was they started showing me around. You see, I had, they were telling me I had to cut weeds. I had to trim the bushes. I had to, I had to uh, cut the grass. And while they were telling me this, I'm looking at this big old yard. I had to cut grass, trim the weeds, and, 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 and trim the bushes. And the first thing that came to my mind was, well, I think I got more into what I expected here. You know what? It was so many weeds, so many bushes, bushes all over the place, and so many weeds to pull, but it was just one of me doing the work. So you see, the bushes and the weeds and, 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 and all the cutting that I had to do, I still went on ahead and did it. 
I went on ahead and did the job. And guess what? I got my Converse All-Stars. But one thing I learned, I learned what labor was. Labor in the hot sun, working, working hard. From then on, I knew as you look in the, in the newspaper and say, help wanted laborers. I, had, I, I understood what labor was, hard work. Now, in our world today, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. You see, we're dealing with a pandemic. It's not going anywhere. We have gun violence in our streets and the streets across the country. And the heartbreaking part about this is we have children killing children. And that really breaks my heart. We're burying our children with this gun violence. We have corruption. People that are lovers of themselves and lovers of money. This is what Jesus sees when he looks at his creation then and even now. Jesus was asking for laborers then, and that memo is still out today. It says, help one it. In our text this morning, Jesus is going to tell his disciples, and he's telling us too, that there's a lot of work that has to be done, and more workers are needed. Now, are we disciples of Jesus? You better believe it, because all believers are called to be followers of Jesus Christ, the Great Commission. Disciples that go out, that makes disciples. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading to us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be we counsel to God. It's like an ambassador, like the United States have ambassadors in Russia, Japan, China. They represent America. We represent Jesus Christ in this foreign land. So if we represent Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ will be reaching out for the lost. He will be proclaiming the gospel to reach the unsaved. Now that we know what this job entails, let's see what the qualifications are. My first qualification is willing to put the work in. We have to be willing to put the work in. And Verse 35 in our text this morning, it says, Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and disease among the people. In this verse, it tells us that Jesus was doing an awful lot of work. But he was just scratching the surface of all the people that needed to be touched by the love of God. Jesus never wasted a second, though, in his three-year ministry, always teaching and preaching and performing miracles. But you know what? Miracles do not save anyone. It heals the sick, opens the eyes to the blind, but only the gospel has the power of salvation. And that's where disciples come in. We need to do put some work in, just like Jesus put some work in. We need to study his word daily. We need to digest his word. We need to open up the book of, 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 of the word and we start need to read his word. It's just like when his disciples walk with him. When we read scripture, it's just like he's walking with us today. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for the power of salvation. Lift up his name. Lift up the name of Jesus. Lift up the name of Yahshua. Both of those names is the definition of salvation. Shout it from the rooftops. You don't have to go out with a bullhorn on the corner. Speak to your neighbors, speak to your coworkers family of friends. The ones that, and we know, every, we know some people that are, are not saved. 
I think about it like this. Satan has a trophy room with all the victories of all the lost souls he has on his walls. Like hunters in our, in, in our time, they have heads of animals they killed in the hunt on their trophy wall. Our job is to keep as many souls as we possibly can out of Satan's trophy room. It's all about souls, y'all. I want to say that again. It's all about souls. If you would allow me, let me share this joke with you that I ran across while I was studying for this message. We all know that Satan had a limited access to heaven. The other name that they use for Satan is the accuser. He would attempt to discredit believers in front of God. But you know what? We do have an advocate. We have the lawyer in the courtroom. Thank you, Jesus. One day, though, Satan went to, went, went to heaven and he said, I want to challenge you, God, to a baseball game. And God said, you don't have a chance. You see, I have Mickey Mantle, Joe DiMaggio, Lou Gehrig. I have all the greats. Well, that might be so, Satan said. But I have all the umpires. But you know what? We need to talk to some of them umpires, too. You watch some of these sports on TV, they need help, you know? So I, I, I really, I was really laughing when I saw that. But actually, it's, it's a true statement in a way. You know, Satan is gathering up souls, you know? And our job is to gather up souls for Jesus. Labor is hard work. And you're not to get, going to get rich or gain any fame for doing this kind of work. The devil has been at this for a long time. He's perfected his craft for thousands of years. But you know what? He knows the end of his story. He knows what's going to happen to him when, when it's all said and done. He knows where he's going. Where he's going. So he wants to take as many souls as he possibly can with him. That's where we come in. That's, that's another way why we come in. We come in because we're ambassadors to Jesus. We're trying to talk to people to, so they can get to know Jesus and have a relationship with Jesus. So they, so they can actually become a disciple that goes out and make disciples. In Proverbs 11.30, and it says, the fruit of all righteousness is a tree of life. And he who wins souls is wise. Wow. The life of a soul winner impacts people in such a powerful way. Because it is the heartbeat of God. In Luke 15, 10, Jesus says, Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over a sinner who repents. Wow. They be having a party up there sometime. You know what? Isn't it awesome if we can we can bring a soul to Jesus and they having a party? In your heart, you're having a party too. Every time a lost sheep is found, the angels are having a party. You know, I was one of those lost sheep. I was lost. I was one of those lost sheep at one time. He left that 99 and came and found me. Just like he came and found you. And everybody that's online listening to me, if you are a disciple, he came and found you. But, I, you know, when I'm out there and I'm talking, I'm with my brother Chris and we're talking to people. Sometimes they might, they might say, well, they, because they don't really want to have a conversation with you. They might say a statement like, well, I found Jesus. I already found Jesus. My answer for that is, well, Jesus was never lost. He was never lost. You remember that story where Jesus was only 12 years old? Joseph and Mary went to Jerusalem for Passover. Took the family there. After Passover, they're on their way back home. They realized Jesus wasn't with them. Oh, they panicked. Oh, they freaked out. They said, oh, where's my son? We lost our son. So they rushed back to Jerusalem. Guess Jesus, we all know Jesus was in the synagogue. He was teaching and he was preaching. 12 years old. 
His mother ran up to you. Oh, I thought we lost you. You know what Jesus said to his mother? I'm not lost. I'm about doing my father's business. That's what I'm talking about today. Let's be about our father's business. Reaching souls for Jesus. My second qualification is you have to have compassion. Now, this is important. But when, and in verse 36, it says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Here we see the true heart of Jesus. For his mission was to seek and to save the lost. He was moved with compassion. Jesus saw multitudes of people on their way to hell. I'm not going to sugarcoat it because that's what it is. Today, Jesus sees masses of people without direction. No comfort. People are scattered all over without any direction. Like lost sheep. We need to look at the world the same way Jesus looks at the world. Look through his lenses. Don't fo focus on the outward appearance of people. What do you see when you see a drug addict? Do you see someone that's dirty? See somebody that you really don't, you want to step over or somebody you just want to get away from? Or do you see a child of God? What about an alcoholic? Do you see someone without hope? Do you see someone that actually that's all they care about is that, that next drink? Or do you see a child of God? Well, we have a lot of young people out here growing up wrong, thinking that putting a gun in their hand will solve all their problems. Or do we see children of God? We need to keep praying for these children. We need to keep them in prayer. We need to show more compassion. We pray daily and ask God to help. Help us to start seeing people as he sees them. With love, compassion, and patience. All people matter to God. It doesn't matter who they are, where they come from, or even what they believe. Christ died for us all. And it is all about having a relationship with us all. In verse 37, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Now, if you think you qualify, and trust me, if you are a disciple of Jesus, you qualify. Then you submit your application, give it to Jesus. Hand it over to him. Submit that application to Jesus. You see, the harvest is a good thing, and Jesus sees a plentiful harvest then and now. There's an awful lot of people that are ready to hear the word. There's an awful lot of people that needs that word of salvation. They need that hope that Jesus can offer. All we have to do is we just go to get out there and do some work. Get out there and spread the gospel. But it is a harvest that needs laborers. The good of the harvest can go to waste if there is no laborers. That's like if you, let's say you own a big farm, a lot of land. You got potatoes, onions, you got corn, all kind of stuff you're growing on your thing. But what if you, uh, harvest comes and you don't have no laborers? All that goes to waste. What we're saying today is don't let no souls go to waste. Jesus has done when none of these souls will go to waste. That's why he's calling for us to pray for, for workers. In John 4, 30, 35, it says, do, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for the harvest. You know what? God is still asking the same thing he asked in Isaiah 6. Who shall I send? And who will go for us? 
My answer is the same as Isaiah's. Here I am, send me. I would like to ask you, do you have the Lord send me attitude? Do you sit up and say, Lord, send me? I like, I like that worship song we sung this morning. I surrender all. Send me, Lord. Use me for your glory and for your kingdom. In verse 38, Jesus says, Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This was a command to his disciples to pray for workers. But see, Jesus didn't command to do, uh, his disciples to do something that he did not do himself. You know, that's a good leader. That actually shows by example. When he comes in, your boss comes and tells you that he would like you to do something, I bet you if he's a good leader, you've seen him do it. Jesus did the same thing. Because in chapter 9 that I'm in right now, the very next chapter in chapter 10, Jesus called his 12 apostles. He was getting ready to send them out. But the Bible says that the night before, he spent all night long praying to the Father. Now, it's just me thinking, but I'm quite sure during that prayer, Jesus was asking his Father, send me some workers so I can send them out. So, Jesus describes the workers of his kingdom as laborers. Those are people who work hard. What Jesus is saying here, it's like, if, let's say you got hired in a big factory and they asked for laborers and they hired you for that job. Now you go into that big factory and you look around, it's nothing but, you can't even see the end of the wall, but you see a lot of work. But guess what? You, you, you recognize there's not a lot of people in there working. What happens is that just made your job a lot harder. But you know what? The fewer workers there are, the harder the work is. And there is plenty of work for everybody out here, y'all. As true believers and followers of Christ, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. We need to be reaching the lost for Jesus. Now, I know some of us might feel that I'm an introvert or I might not know what to say or I, I don't know how to approach people. But I'll tell you what the Bible says. Don't worry about what you're going to say. Because the Spirit of God will speak through you. He will speak for you. He'll let you know what to say. And that is so true. Sometimes I, I'll be speaking to people. I don't even remember what I said. Or, and, what, and what it is, is when you read the word of God, you're putting that in you. You're putting that in your spirit. And what you put in is what comes out. So don't be worried about what you're going to say. Even, you, know, you don't have to be on the corner, like I said before, but to a family member that's lost, to a friend that's lost, that opportunity Jesus comes up, bring it up. And all you have to do is just give a testimony like Pastor George says. We all have a testimony. Tell them what Jesus did for you. That is power. Now you have heard it said, be careful of what you pray for. Now if you pray for, for workers for the harvest, God may tap you on the shoulder. And he'll say, what about you? Will you be a worker in my harvest? You see, God uses saved people to save other people. So when God taps you on the shoulder over your neighbor's house, your family's member's house, at your job, you see, we all do know somebody that's not saved. So when he taps you on your shoulder, you should feel the same way Jesus feels. Your heart is broken because they are on their way to hell. You see, God brings you out to bring others out. Now, I had mentioned this little story before in a message I had a while back, and I think it's appropriate here. That's like me walking down the street, and I see somebody's house on fire. I'm, I, it's in flames. It's on fire. 
Do I keep walking or do I stop and just look? No. I'm running up those steps and I'm banging on the door and I'm going to do whatever I possibly can to pull you out of that burning house. That's what it's all about. Hell's no joke. Hell is burning fire. I wouldn't want to wish that on my worst enemy. So our job is to, to save souls from that burning hell. Now here at Philadelphia Bible Fellowship, we have a church without walls. My fellow brother, Chris, he, he came in. I'm glad to see you, Chris. Me and Chris have an outreach ministry. Because of Chris, we have a prison ministry. I met Chris and he, I knew he went into the prison. I asked him, how can I join him? He walked me along, I got my badge, and we, we started going into the prison on a weekly basis. We have a KNA ministry, Kensington and Allegheny. Before, the, before COVID, we was going every two weeks on a regular basis in the neighborhood. And matter of fact, next Saturday, we plan on going back out to KNA. Prison ministry, we get the word that we're hopeful that it's going to start up again. We get the word that they're, they're looking forward to having ministry come back in. And we're going to try to start an outreach program here in Longcrest, here in the neighborhood of our home church. So we will be out here in front of the church on a regular basis where we're given hope and we're given the name of Jesus. So the reason I'm saying that is because I would like for to invite anybody, man or woman, and that includes the prison ministry, man or woman, to come and join us on this outreach ministry here at Philadelphia Bible Fellowship. Because to go out and to give hope to people that think they are lost, they, they, don't, have, they don't have any alternative, our alternative is Jesus Christ. So we're asking you to come and talk to Chris or talk to myself. We'd be glad to have you with us. We'd be glad to have you with us as we're going out reaching souls. Now, if there's anyone in the sound of my voice that is not saved, I pray, I pray that you change the direction that you are heading in, that wide road of destruction. The Bible says, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Now, if you do that, Jesus will take over. Jesus will handle uh, your, your min the ministry of you becoming a disciple. You'll start reading the word, and then you, we will welcome you into the family of Christ. And the angels in heaven will have another party. Let's look to the Lord. Lord of the harvest, we see that your harvest field is ripe and ready all over this nation and world. We long to see your kingdom come on this earth and to do everything we can to obey your commission to go into all the world. If we, can, if we cannot go, help us to support the ones that are sent. God, I ask that you grant us this compassion and the eyes to see people the way that, you, that Jesus sees them. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And thank you. Thank you for your time. <laughs>